Well, good evening, everyone. I know how it goes at the end of a day, an active day at Bible school. You can uh, start to feel a little bit sleepy. So this evening, I'm hoping, is uh, a bit interactive. Some of you have worksheets, it sounds like. Some of you don't, so that always helps in terms of uh, having something to engage with. But if you don't, uh, as Stephen was mentioning, never fear. Uh, essentially, it's three questions. The questions aren't even on the page because you'll see them as we go along. And then there's some blank spaces to fill in your answers as we go along. So if you don't have one of the handouts, uh, please just grab a blank sheet of paper and uh, everything will be okay. So tonight we want to talk about building a kingdom culture together in our ecclesias. And like we took a look at in our opening reading in Philippians chapter 2, we do live in a wicked and perverse generation. It's not getting any easier to live the truth. Things that were commonly understood, commonly accepted, are now being questioned. Even some of the basic elements of male and female seem to be causing confusion in the days in which we live, which makes it incredibly challenging for us as a community, for our young people growing up, to really be able to understand what is truth. This was a question that Pilate asked when the Lord Jesus Christ spoke to him about truth. He said, what is truth? And of course, we know that God's truth is firm. The foundation is clear. And thankfully, we don't need to do that on our own. We don't need to live the truth on our own, as is evidenced by wonderful events like this that we have with Bible school. And then as we go home from Bible school, we have our individual ecclesians, brothers and sisters, an ecclesial family that's really intended to help us on our walk toward the kingdom. The thing is, it's worth asking, what kind of culture do we have in our ecclesias? And is that the culture that we desire? Because culture quite often is something that we don't think about. It's just a resultant of a bunch of people's behaviors. And so it's worth spending a little bit of time considering what culture do we have, what culture would we like to have, and how can we work together to build a kingdom culture to ultimately help us on our walk to the kingdom. But before looking at the ecclesia overall, it's worth each of us taking a step back and looking at ourselves and reminding ourselves of what is our reason for being. When you take a look at the Lord Jesus Christ, he provided a model for us as to what his why was. And his why was to be a living example of God's character in every circumstance. So no matter what the circumstance was, when people interacted with Jesus, they were able to see how God would behave, what God would say, the decision that God would make in that particular situation. And so if we're to model our lives after the Lord Jesus Christ, what does it look like for us for somebody to meet Jesus Christ in our interactions with them? Perhaps we've heard the saying that we might be the only Bible that some people ever read. And we might be as close to Jesus Christ as some people ever get. It's a pretty sobering thought to think about in regards to our behavior as to who are people meeting when they meet us. Are they meeting the Lord? Because this was our Lord's reason for being, to be a living example of his Father in every circumstance. And this is why he existed. He said, I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. I come to do thy will, O God. Hebrews 10 and verse 7. And even at the very end, as he struggled to follow through, nevertheless, not my will, but thine will be done, yielding to his Father's will and pressing on joyfully to pursue the crown that was set before him. And this isn't something that Jesus did in a vacuum. This is something that he did in proclaiming God's way to be right through the salvation of others, that this is how he showed that God was right, by saving himself and by saving others, by following through on what God had commanded him to do. And the way that Jesus did this, his how to support that why was to develop God's character in himself and in other people. We're familiar with the Sermon on the Mount, at the end of Matthew chapter 6, and verses 33 and 34, where we're told to seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto us. Right? Well, there's a piece that we miss sometimes when thinking about seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Sometimes the piece that we leave off 
So what is the righteousness of God? Well, the righteousness of God, this was the same question that Moses had back in Exodus, where he said, show me your glory. And God then went on in Exodus 34 to reveal his character to Moses, that this was his glory, this was his righteousness. And so we read in Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you might prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And of course, we're probably familiar with transformation, meaning a metamorphosis, a change that occurs. And uh, there was a hammock that was out here uh, a couple days ago, and I kept expecting my son to emerge like a butterfly coming out of his cocoon. But it's an interesting image, you know, when you see that there's something that goes in in one form and comes out another. And when we think about our minds, sometimes we like to just move the furniture around in our minds. We don't want to make the big reformation, the true transformation that's required. Perhaps we've seen some of those makeovers that occur when it comes to a home of where the new looks nothing like the old. It's a complete renovation, stripped down to the studs and rebuilt to look nothing like what the original was. That's the intent when we take a look at what God is trying to do with our minds and the development of our character, this mental transformation. And he says, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, in our opening reading in Philippians 2, verses 5 to 9, where he made himself of no reputation and took on him the form of a servant that he humbled himself, became obedient unto death. And as a result, God has highly exalted him. And one of the form, formational or foundational elements that's spoken of here when it came to the Lord Jesus Christ was the need for humility of emptying himself of self, even though he was the Son of God, that he emptied himself of himself and took on the form of a servant. And so when we think about for ourselves, our why, and trying to be a living example of the Lord Jesus Christ, working out our salvation through our brothers and sisters to try to transform not only our minds, but to aid each other in that mental transformation, we remember that the foundational element is humility. And that humility isn't something that we teach ourselves, but that humility is something that God teaches us through life circumstances. And when we pray for humility... We're praying for experiences that will humble us in the course of our lives, which can be a very challenging thing to pray for, because God will give us those opportunities to develop humility. And so how then is the ecclesia a mechanism for developing the mind of Christ? Because if this is the secret, if, if this is the key that each one of us are supposed to be developing, then how does the ecclesia factor into that? So I went back to some of the foundational documents of the community and I took a look at the Ecclesial Guide where it talks about the objectives of an Ecclesia. And Robert Roberts back in 1883 wrote this to help provide guidance for Ecclesia's conduct and the purpose. And based on scripture, he identified two primary objectives for an Ecclesia. The first is edification. So refreshment, encouragement, strengthening and building up of the individual constituents in the faith. So the edifying of itself in love. So when we think about the members that we have already, building each other up. Right? And we think about some of the imagery that's used in 1 Peter 2 of living stones, of where each of us become part of that temple of the living God. And that we help each other out in that regard by building each other up in the scriptures, building relationships, helping each other on the pathway to the kingdom. But lest we become too internally focused, there's a second aspect here, which is exhibition. The exhibition of the light of the truth to those that are without Christ. And it's interesting because if we focus too much on one or the other, and we don't focus on both, we can find that we become imbalanced. So, for example, if we focus too inwardly, and we don't remember to preach the word outwardly, then maybe there's not enough of a motivation inwardly to work through some of the challenges. And I'll show a slide in a moment to help illustrate that. It provides a level of accountability when we know that exhibition, that sharing the light of the gospel, 
is an important element for our walk in the truth, to continue to bring others into Christ. If we focus only on exhibition and not on edification, then you can run into situations like what occurred in Acts chapter 6, of where there were those who were maybe not being cared for. And the apostles said, look, we're not going to stop preaching to take care of the waiting of tables, but that's important. We need to make sure that people within the ecclesia are taken care of. And so both of those elements were vitally important when we take a look at the scriptures. And so in this twofold capacity, the ecclesia is the pillar, that which upholds, and the ground, that which gives standing room of the truth. And this is why edification matters. So if you think about building up of the sheepfold, and you take a look at the top, if we go out and try to exhibit the truth, and we're going to preach, and we've got a sheepfold that looks like what you see on the bottom, it's going to be really difficult to actually bring people into an ecclesia that's a mess. So there's a level of accountability for us to be unified, to be working together, so that when we bring others into the ecclesia and we exhibit the light of the gospel, there's a place that we can bring people back to that actually is edifying, that is nurturing, that helps to build them up. And so that's what I meant by this level of accountability. It helps us to remember that there needs to be a home. This needs to be a place of therapy, of healing, that others can come to feel built up in. So with that being the case, I wanted to introduce this aspect of culture. And uh, this individual, Robert Coles, he was like an international ambassador for the United States for a number of years. He did some intercultural studies with different nations. And this was his distillation of what culture is. That culture is an integrated system of learned behavior patterns that are characteristic of the members of any given society. That it includes everything that a group of people thinks, says, and does. Culture is learned and transmitted from generation to generation. So I read that a few times, and I tried to think, all right, what is this actually distill out into? It's getting late in the evening, so help me out here. What's the, what's the so what of this? And so there's a few things that come out, that culture is learned. It's something that's picked up. So when somebody new comes into our ecclesia, or the young people are growing up in our ecclesia, what do they experience Are people included? What are the conversations like? What are the Bible studies like? When somebody enters into our ecclesia and they haven't been there before, what do they experience from a learning perspective? It's manifested in certain behavioral norms. It's acted out. So what is the normal behavior in our ecclesia? How do those interactions look? And just trying to think through on a weekly basis, what a Sunday morning looks and feels like, what a midweek class is like, what our preaching activities are like, what are the behavioral norms for how brothers and sisters treat each other when issues arise and when crucial conversations need to take place? Is it done in a spirit that moves people further toward the kingdom? Or is it done in a way that actually sends people in different directions? What are those behavioral norms for us when it comes to how we act out the culture that we have within our ecclesia? And it's transmitted from generation to generation. It's something that we pass on. And so it's worth asking ourselves the question as to what are we passing on to the next generation? That if our Lord remains away, what is the legacy that's being left behind of our ecclesias? And is that the legacy that we want it to be? Because if we're not intentional about culture, what we'll find is that we have a culture that leads to the opposite of what we desire. We'll have a culture that promotes the things of the flesh versus the things of the spirit, because that's what comes natural to us. And if we go forward unconsciously, we'll find that we get a result that is not desirable. So... This is a good time for some interaction because uh, the evening is wearing on. So help me out here with a little group exercise. I'll say the name of a biblical group, and you help me out with the culture that you would use to define that, the one phrase or one word that comes to mind, just to help us kind of solidify this concept that this cultural piece is a scriptural 
um, thing that we can take a look at. So we'll play a little game of name that culture. All right, so the first one, Israel during the Judges. Everybody did that which was right in their own eyes, right? That one comes out pretty clearly, Joshua 21 and verse 25. That might makes right. They're ungodly. So we read in Judges chapter 2, verses 10 to 13. All right, how about Israel during Joshua's leadership? What would you say for this one? As long as Joshua was alive, right? So it was kind of single generational. What was a phrase that... What, what's that? Be strong and of good courage. That was one that came to mind. So faithful for one generation, right? And strong and courageous were some of the things that came along with that, of what Moses passed on to Joshua, what Joshua communicated to the people. Sadly, it didn't pass on for additional generations. But nonetheless, during this time period, there was a very strong culture in their community. How about the culture of the Pharisees? Do as I say, not as I do, right? Are you reading the slides? All right, so we have hypocritical, right? Do as I say, not as I do. They were exclusive, right? Even Pharisee itself means a separatist. They were holy because not holy from evil, separate from evil, but separate from other people. This is how they distinguish themselves as being righteous. How about the first century ecclesia? What would we use to describe all things in common, one accord? Those are good. So I had joyful. That comes up a number of times. Generous, having all things common. Unified, they were in one accord. And they were active in preaching. And uh, there's a number of references that apparently I didn't put into uh, to that section there, but you can find that they're very active in their preaching. Thank you. Yeah, they're there. Don't worry. So when it comes to this next one, think about this. My ecclesia. What comes to mind for you when you think about your ecclesia and the culture in your ecclesia? It's very easy when we read through some of the scriptural examples, and we can call those to mind, but it's worth just jotting a couple notes. Like, what would be the one phrase or the one word that you might just jot down? And don't worry, I won't ask anyone to incriminate themselves unless you really want to, but I found it to be a helpful exercise as to what might that be for us when it comes to our ecclesia. And thinking about the fact that the culture of our ecclesia extends beyond the few hours or uh, each week that we get together on a Sunday or at a midweek class. Questions that we could ask that might help us to identify what the answer to that might be is, what is my ecclesia known for by other areas? So not necessarily what we want to be known for, but what are we actually known for? What do we hear about our ecclesia? What do you want to be known for? Do those two things line up in terms of what your ecclesia is known for and what you'd like it to be known for? And then remembering the answer to this question of who decides what we're known for. Sometimes we just feel like, hey, other people have their opinions, but where do those opinions come from? And remembering that we as members of our ecclesias actually get to decide what our ecclesias look like and interact like. And no, individually, we can't just change everything, but we can take ownership. And if each individual member takes ownership and aligns together, wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? And so the first question that comes to mind is what does the ideal ecclesial culture look like? So if you've got your little uh, sheet of paper in front of you, or if you don't have a sheet of paper... Please uh, get one out. And if you just write next to question one, what does the ideal ecclesial culture look like? I'll give us a couple of minutes to write down what comes to mind for you. Does anyone want to share... 
Something. Yeah, John. Yeah, but those are true. Can you have a notice? And um, you have a steamy. Yeah, steaming others better than ourselves. And I think the tune that might have been going was uh, our opening hymn, right? Brethren, let us walk together. So some good thinking music for us. Yeah, Brother John. Biblical. Biblical. Yeah, Martha. Tell me a little more. Can you just put that on the slide? (laughs) Yeah, so those are great. Yeah, John. Now, I'm going to focus on your word ideal, but unlikely. Like you said ideal. All right. Unspotted from the world. Unspotted from the world. And this is an ideal state that we're taking a look at. So there is a current state, and then there's ideal state, right? So, yeah, unspotted from the world. And that was Psalm 15, right, Martha? Yeah, go ahead, Andrew. Uh, there's a personal joy in living Christ personally. Hmm. So the aspect of joy coming in? Yeah, and you could end that. Yeah. Yeah, I, just to keep us rolling here, spiritually edifying was one that uh, came to my mind. This isn't like the answer key. These are just things that came into my mind. So there's other lists that are much better, like Psalm 15. Oh, yeah, go ahead, Peter. Yeah, I was uh, thinking of things. Yeah, those are great elements, aren't they, at the end of Acts 2 there that come up that really help to talk about the need for it to be spiritually edifying, for there to be that doctrine that's there, the, the fellowship, the breaking of bread, the prayers that really bring the, uh, the brethren together. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, picking up on the symbol of the lampstand, like it just should be just a light source for families, individuals, and a community. Yep. So providing light in the age in which we live, right? And so as you think through your own list of, of what those things are that you have jotted down, keep in your mind the context of what's the current state, of where you're currently at within your ecclesia, not to denigrate, oh, you know, we're not doing as well as I'd like or something like that, but more just to fix in your mind, what is the vision of success? What does the ideal state look like based on scripture? To have somewhere that does have strong relationships where people are caring about each other, to where others feel included as a part of the family, to where it is enjoyable that we can have joy in our service, and the question that keeps coming back into our minds isn't, you know, like, hey, I wish the AB would do a lot better job, or there's this, you know, if this other brother, other sister could just get their act together, the culture would be a lot better around here. Because our ability to affect change is the strongest when we look in the mirror, right? Because if we can take it from the position of being a recipient of culture and look at it from the perspective of being an owner, it's really, really impactful to think about who is responsible for creating the culture in our ecclesias. And so if you were to ask the question, what would it look like to have a kingdom culture in our ecclesia, that would really be one way of describing the ideal state of where every single interaction that we have in the ecclesia is designed to help others toward the kingdom. That every time someone comes to the ecclesia, every time we have a Bible class, every time we work through a situation, it's done in a way to where we feel closer to the kingdom as a result. Ideal state, challenging, yes, but worth pursuing to pursue a kingdom culture of where all these interactions help us toward the kingdom. That is the ideal state. What would that look like for us? And so the second question is really a two-part question here. What are the behavioral enablers for an ideal ecclesial culture? And what are the behavioral disablers for the ideal ecclesial culture? So once again, I'll give you a couple minutes in that second box to just jot those down. What do you think are tangible enablers and tangible disablers that you've experienced?
Does anyone want to share what they have for either enablers? Well, we'll start with enablers. What do you think? John, you had mentioned esteeming others better than ourselves, right? Would be one of the elements. Yep. I'd add to that, you know, take the example of the New Testament reading that they are willing to open the scriptures and, and you know, openly discuss what the reading is biblically based. Mm. Yeah, sound Bible reasoning to work through issues. Bible's open. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, Brother John. After last week uh, with Jeremiah, a disabler, which is one and the other, uh, they lost the book of the law, which was an extreme disabler. Um, and so having our pages sort of biblically centered and uh, God centered, uh, that's the center of the culture. That's what we hold up as our go to. It will go a long way. Yep. So keeping God at the center, and when he's not at the center, that becomes a disabler for us, right? Yeah, but it's him. Honesty and integrity of holiness can be revealed in the opposite side of our style, in the speaking, and in Yeah. Yeah, thank you for those. Oh, Tim, go ahead. I think uh, having a common vision for your church and for yourself. And, uh, Coming together on this, this kind of thing. Sometimes you can just be used to just attending and showing up. And sometimes you push yourself around. Yeah, so a project that the Ecclesia is working on together, people have a role in the project, feel a purpose, reason for being there. Yeah, those are all really helpful. Go ahead, Dan. Yeah. Yeah, great point. Which extends beyond the four ecclesial walls, right? Yeah, Pete. Hmm. Um, I think the very least we can do is tell uh, there's a minimum requirement. And you know, so often the Ecclesiastes uh, you know, we can just get into a habit of turning up on Sunday morning. But for whatever reason, we're not out on Sunday evening, we're not out for five o'clock. But when it feels like it's pleasant, it's because everyone turns up. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so, so attendance, minimum requirement. Yep. Appreciate that. Those are all good. i got to add some to my list, as you'll see in a moment. Uh, so some of these I had, and some of them I need to add in, right? But seeing the best in each other. Uh, so that's presuming positive intent. Esteeming others better than ourselves, giving the benefit of the doubt, asking how we can help, being forgiving, looking out for each other, uh, in addition to the ones that have once said. Uh, harmful communication would be a disabler, gossiping, exclusivity, labeling, comparing, judging, moving away from the scriptures. These are just some things that come to mind, and I'm sure that each of you have your own list now based on writing some of these things down. But it's worth doing a bit of an assessment of current state, what's going well, what needs improvement, versus ideal state of ultimately where we'd like to be. And so just thinking through that for ourselves, because each of us may have a, a bit of a different answer, but what are those greatest areas of opportunity that we want to personally lean into to really try to help our ecclesias, and ultimately will help ourselves too, to move toward the kingdom, to create that atmosphere to where each of us are edified and can exhibit the truth in the best possible way. Some of the things that came to mind for me, just personal examples. You know, I wonder how many of us struggle when we get into a group setting of saying the right things or maybe saying the wrong things. Conversations can kind of take on a life of their own, can't they? As we end up talking and we end up going in a different direction, perhaps, than something that's edifying. And we might get caught up in a group chat on our phone or just a, a chat with some of our brothers and sisters, and we realize afterwards, wow, that, that really wasn't edifying. That's not a place where I'd like to go. And I remember personally growing up, um, that was something and continues to be something, but that was especially something that I struggled with growing up 
is that was a way that I tried to fit in with the older group. I thought, you know what, if I can crack a joke that's funny and other people like think that that's hilarious, then they'll want me to continue to be around. And it led me down a pathway sometimes of saying things that weren't really appropriate. And later on, my conscience would smite me about, wow, you know, I, I really hate feeling this way afterwards because this isn't who I want to be. And I remember sitting through a class one time, uh, Uncle Roy Stiles was giving it, and he, uh, he was talking about different examples of stuff that we might be struggling with. And he said, well, you know, maybe in a group uh, you happen to struggle with saying things that aren't appropriate. And I was like, you know, wait a minute, like, he's talking to me. And I felt like he was looking right at me. I don't know if you've ever been to a Bible class like that where it feels like somebody's, like, talking right to you and, like, knows what your issues are. But I felt that way. I'm sure he was just, you know, panning the audience. But it was personally convicting to me. And I went home saying, you know what, I really need to improve on that. That's something that I need to work on because I, I got kind of tired of feeling like later that I had just damaged my relationship with God in, in the effort to try to you know, fit in with other people. And whatever that happens to be for us, wherever it is that our conscience smites us, it's worth considering, like, is that something that we want to live with or is that something that we want to commit to changing? Because we can make the changes and move toward that at any point in time if we are convicted to do so. We know that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. But we have to make the conviction. Right? We have to have that conviction and we have to move forward based on that. And there's uh, something that's pretty impactful when you think about it, um, hopefully not after the fact, but during the moment, is would I want this brought up at the judgment seat? Would I want what I'm about to type into my phone? Or what I'm about to say in a group of people to be brought up by Jesus at the judgment seat. And it's an interesting hypothetical to think about, but it's a reality because Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 12, verses 36 to 37, that that is the case. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Every careless word. And this isn't meant to put us in a state of fear, but what it's meant to communicate is if we are in a habit of speaking carelessly, saying things without thought, Jesus will bring those things up because they will be characteristic of the way that we've lived our lives. So how do you feel when you read verses like this? How does that make us feel inwardly about the conviction that we have based on our communication? Do we look at words with the power that they truly have? Because when you consider words in Scripture, words bring life and words bring death. Like you think about when we were down on the, uh, the shore today and uh, we were all showcasing our terrible golf skills and uh, you know people were lining up and getting ready to hit the golf ball. There were a couple of times when little kids just kind of ventured out toward the water, and it was every, whoa, 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 wait a minute, stop the show, right? we got to make sure that we bring this child back from the danger zone, to bring it back behind the line. Do we have that same level of discipline with our communication of when we start to cross the line, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, you know, we're moving into a position here of where we're moving down the pathway of death with the things that we're communicating. So you think about some of the scriptural references. It says in Psalm 33 and verse 6, By the Lord's decree, the heavens were made. By a mere word from his mouth, all the stars in the sky were created. Just allow that to sink in as you take a look in the sky. You can actually see the stars out here, that by one word of our Heavenly Father, all the stars in the sky were created. Genesis chapter 1, God said, and it was so. By God's words, life itself was created. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life, said Jesus in John 6 and verse 63. Proverbs 18 and verse 21 brings in the other aspect of what comes from words, that death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. It's a choice as to what it is that we communicate. But the tongue can no man tame, and is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. James 3 and verse 8. So our words are containers, having the power of life and death. What are we filling those containers with? 
in the way that we communicate. And this is something that each of us, I'm sure, has room for improvement on. There's a very practical reason as well to not only improve in our communication, not only because we will be accountable for the way that we communicate, but there's a reason for accountability in the present age in which we live. Everything that we communicate online becomes part of our digital fingerprint, right? And what we do on social media, the way that we present ourselves, it's there forever. That becomes part of the permanent fingerprint of who we are and the way that we communicate. Another impactful story that hit me from uh, a little bit of time ago at, at one of my employers is uh, I was working on a, a particular situation where there was uh, a legal claim that some of our vehicles would catch on fire. And so I was involved in this investigation and uh, we were collecting data and uh, at the time, I was working with uh, the lead counsel uh, on the case. And uh, it was late one Friday, and we were trying to wrap up. And uh, he has a bit of a gray beard. You know, he'd been around for a long time. And he was giving me some, uh, some sagely words of advice. He said, you know what, Brian? He said, any time that you're going to communicate something, even if it's uh, an email that's just internal, just remember, everything is discoverable. All right, so what I want you to remember before you communicate anything is I want you to picture what you're about to write as being on the front page of the New York Times. That's what I want you to think about before you send that communication. And what's interesting is we went through the case. Things were successful there. But then within a number of weeks, a report came out that had this person's name all over it that was actually very public throughout the nation, and this person was summarily let go from the company. Somebody that directly reported to the head of the company was now gone. Decades of a career just up in flames because they didn't follow this advice of thinking about the way that they communicate before they communicate. And if this is the case for someone's career, of what somebody has spent their life on, how much more so when it comes to eternity? To think about not only the things that we're about to text or the things that we're about to say as being on the front page of the New York Times, but thinking about those things as being recorded in the book of life as representative of the way that we communicate. Because when you go through Scripture, you can find that there's one phrase that characterizes many of the individuals in Scripture that represents their whole life in one phrase. What would that be for us? Not what do we want it to be, but what would it be for us based on how we're currently communicating? The key is that the ecclesia can't be a stage that we come to each week to perform the play of godliness. If each of us puts on our costumes and comes to meeting and we act out what righteousness is supposed to look like, and then we go home and we live a completely different life. We're all smart enough to know when we're faking it. And it will not have the power to transform. It will not build the culture and the ecclesias that we're looking for it to build. This is not the play of godliness. We actually need to live godliness. And each of us has a role in making it real. Maybe we find ourselves as a young person, as somebody who others naturally follow. When others follow our lead, where does it lead to? Because whether or not we're conscious that people are following us, they are. And if we're not conscious, then our actions and our leadership is going to lead to the grave. So it's very important that we think about where we are leading because other people are following and how often do you think in the moment, how is this going to impact someone? Will this help them on their way to the kingdom, or will it make it more difficult? I still hear stories, you know, from growing up of people who struggled in CYC and things that people said at the time. I mean, teenagers, we've all been there. We don't always think too far beyond step one. Right? What's step two? Well, I, you know, I didn't really think about that. And it's not picking on the teens in the audience because it's something that each of us has struggled with and potentially still struggle with. 
But I'll still hear stories decades later of how somebody still has scar tissue from things that people communicated carelessly. And our words have a real impact, either for good or for bad. On the other hand, you can think through amazing experiences that people have had of going to Bible school or going to CYC or coming to an ecclesial function. What do we want that mark to be, the indelible mark that's left, the impress that our ecclesias leave on each other of being positive or of being the opposite? And so when you look around the room, there's no guarantee that any of us are still going to be here 10 years or 5 years or maybe even less. There's a number of people that I grew up with that simply don't continue to come out. And if we take each other for granted then we'll find that it becomes much easier for people to simply disappear. And I've seen people, as I'm sure you have, that have lived their whole life in the truth and then end up walking away. And I know that everybody needs to make their own decisions, but it causes each of us to question, what was my role in that? How could I have been more helpful? And so instead of retrospectively looking back and asking with 2020 hindsight, what could I have done differently? The goal is to be more intentional about being proactive, about looking forward, about being present and engaging with each other while we're here and in the ecclesia and showing hospitality outside the walls of the ecclesia. Our young people are at such a critical time in their lives Lots of decisions are before them as to whether or not they want to get baptized, what they're going to do with their lives. Are they going to go to school or are they not going to go to school? And what are they going to commit their lives to? Is the current state of our ecclesia a place where our young people want to invest? Because we have choices. Our kids have choices. And we want it to be a place where we find value, where we do want to invest. And there's a a key thing as well about not being a bystander. That if we see something, we need to say something. As I remember growing up and an issue came out about somebody else and, oh yeah, everybody kind of knew that that was going on, but nobody really said something. And there's this whole bystander effect and the diffusion of responsibility of where if enough people are around, there's some of these social studies that take place of where If enough people are around, somebody figures, well, this person's hurt. There's probably a doctor or a nurse in the audience. I'm not really, you know, fit to to help this person out. But if I'm the only person and somebody's struggling, I feel a, a greater sense of responsibility to step in, even if I'm not qualified, to try to help that person. We can have the bystander effect of seeing something happening in front of us and not really saying something and allowing it to continue versus stepping in and saying, hey, wait a minute. We should probably be heading down a different pathway here. So a bit of a personal activity, our third question as we come to a close, is to make a commitment ourselves of what will I do? And spending a couple minutes reflecting on what you've written down, of defining the elements of your ecclesial culture, the ideal elements of a kingdom culture within the ecclesia, what's going well, what's not going well, and just write down one thing. Just one thing that you'll personally commit to of driving a kingdom culture in your ecclesia when you return home. So in summary then, a few key points to walk away with. To commit to building a kingdom culture, I have in CYC, in our ecclesias, in our interactions, both individually and collectively. So every interaction being designed to help each other toward the kingdom. Ask, you know, if I say or do X, will it move somebody closer or further away from the kingdom? How can I make the ecclesia a place that edifies each member, builds them up in the word of God? That everyone looks forward to attending. That attendance isn't seen as something that I have to do but it's something that I get to do because I want to go there. It provides value. There's benefit not only for me personally, but for the relationships that are built with others. Building up those friendships, including everyone in the group, and leaves everyone feeling better when they leave than when they came. Similar to what Peter said, that it was good for us to be here. 
And each of us own our part in making this a reality, remembering that culture is picked up, it's acted out, and it's passed on. What do we want our legacy to be? And we know that time is running out when it comes to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I was amazed when we opened the week to see that 50 years at main camp, which is a big deal. You think about 50 years of legacy and all the lives that this camp has touched over the years. The impact that it's had in moving people toward the kingdom. But what do we want our legacy to be when it comes to the kingdom? And so I'd like to conclude just by reading a few encouraging verses from Acts 2, verses 42 to 47 of an ecclesia that had a kingdom culture and how God blessed that. Acts 2, verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common, sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the ecclesia daily such as should be saved. May the Lord continue to add to our ecclesias, build us up in him, that we might be to his praise and his honor, both now and in the